All right, welcome back to What the Hermeneutic. Today we are doing um, what I would say is my uh, preaching life hack. Uh, the, the, the question of pragmatics uh, when it comes to asking good questions, sort of um, speech act theory stuff. We'll get a little bit into that. Uh, so uh, we're glad you're here. Uh, with me, as always, is Cindy, who is a student of biblical hermeneutics, and she'll be leading this discussion as we take the next step uh, of asking the important questions of the text that help us then uh, communicate this, or, or yeah, speak it to others, mm -hmm. uh, confess it even. Uh, so join us for this, share your thoughts as well, and let's get after it. Spit out my Lord in every way, yet I'm still welcome. In the arts. All right, so let's get into it. Pragmatics. What are we talking about? Uh, we are talking about application. So how, a couple different things. How, uh, how does this practically mean anything that we're right, that we're reading in the Bible? Okay. So when you look at literature, when you look at anything, any kind of utterance, any kind of word, speech, uh, conversation, right. it intends to do something. So you're not just saying gibberish words out in the air for no reason. Right. You're trying to communicate something and not just that, but you're, you may be trying to persuade or tell or uh, sure. do, you're doing something, doing something with, the words. with your words. Yeah. And so this is the point now that we've, uh, we've examined what the words are, how they relate to each other, how can we find meaning within the words themselves and in their context. But now we got to ask the question, well, what do we do with all of this information? Yeah, so are you first asking like, yeah, what is, what is it trying to do? Like yeah. what is the author trying to do with it maybe? Yeah, so it's two questions okay. I think really. Uh, well, maybe three questions. We could say it like that. The first question is, what is the meaning? Just, you know, do we understand what the sentence says? Sure. And, um, Which is what we've been talking about right. up till now. So this yeah. is this is what uh, we would call like the locutionary aspect. Okay. Okay. Basic aspect, right? And then um, the next question that we need to ask is, what is the author intending to do? Or what does this count as? What kind of things... Um, just, I mean, basically, what is he doing with his words? Sure, sure. What's he doing with the words? So the classic example I know that you like to give sometimes when you explain this a aspect is uh, the guy going golfing. Yeah, I think Belt's I, I stole it from Belts. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. So the guy is going, he's like loading his clubs in his car, and his wife says, are you going golfing today? And it's like, the, the question is, is she just asking information? Is she asking the question? It's a question. Right. We know the meaning of all the words. Right. Is she simply inquiring as to what his afternoon activity is going mm -hmm. to be? Right. Or is there something more implied in that simple question? Right. Is what, it, is, what does this count as? What, what? is it count? Is it a, an exhortation? Is it a command? Is it a, mm -hmm. a plea? Is it, you know, what is it? A right. threat. <laughs> right. know, who knows, right? And so just to recognize that words do things yes. is really important because uh, our goal is to find out what the words are doing, like what the author is intending the words to do because he's writing them to us and communicating to us and we're trying to figure out like, you know, what these words mean. Uh, so we want to know what he intended like these these words to do to his audience so that we can take that and do the same to our audience right okay so then the next kind of force is not just what does this count as or what can we see it as like a command exhortation but now uh the perlocutionary aspect of this is how can this uh speech act or uh, how does this change? How would you say it? How I usually this... say it is what what does it call the hearer to do? Yes, it's it's inviting a response yes. to these words. Yeah, and it's not just like it, the response could be different. Yeah, you know the response could be just like learning information. Mm -hmm. The response could be like these words said something, and so now they're expecting me to do something. Yeah, these words. I mean, so there's lots of different responses, but 
what is happening is the author's communicating and the reader is actually communicating back sure. with his response. Yeah. So just like laying all of that out on the table, this is what we're usually doing with language is we are talking about what the author's trying to do or the originator of the words and what the receiver, reader, whatever, is going to do then with these words. Uh, so let's just kind of talk about a little, you know, just sort of generally, what are some options that we have in scripture of the illocutionary force? What does this count as? And then the perlocutionary force, what is what is the response intended? Yeah, what's it called to hear the case? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what do you got? Well, okay, first of all, let me, before, I'd like to say this uh, for, for the preachers out there, uh, I, to this day, structure my sermon prep around these conversations. So in other words, uh, you guys all know we do the, the talk and shop videos. We work through the text. Then when I'm in my study and I'm actually, say, outlining the sermon, I've done other research, I'm ready to go. Um, I literally write at the top of the page. I, I still use pen and ink to outline. So I, I still write on the top of the page. I write... Uh, illocutionary aspect, mm -hmm. and I and it's in its technical language is from this speech act theory stuff from pragmatics, and it's and I write out. I say the text counts as, and I fill in the blank. I like get that remedial. I've done it now for twenty some odd years. It doesn't can't like so. It's at the heart of it. What essentially does this count? Is it a command? Is it an exhortation? Is it a promise? Is it? Um, you know, comfort? Is it just imparting information? I mean, but just get to it. What is it? What does it count as? Mm -hmm. And then I write below it, per the accusionary aspect, the text calls the hearers to, mm -hmm. and I fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. It calls the hearers to trust in the promise, calls the hearers to repent. It calls the hearers to, you know, however you're getting down. There. And then below that, then I write for this sermon that I'm preaching, what is the goal of my sermon? And in some way, it ought to reflect mm -hmm. the original intention. The elocutionary and purocutionary aspect of the text right. itself. And it's, so in my mind, that is a textually faithful sermon. Yes. It's like, so it, it orientates me to begin with, uh, I think, on a good, solid footing. Uh, and it, it drove me nuts when I was in seminary that um, I would, I had, uh, hermeneutics and I learned this language and then I moved to my homiletics class and they kind of just switched all the lingo and had their own stuff right. and I was like no this actually carries over yeah. beautifully well yes. and helps us especially this pragmatic so um so definitely check out Belt's book on this uh as we, you know we're definitely going through it here but, yeah, but this, this one, is what it does this one is we're back to the textbook I think does a really great yeah. uh job of getting into the technical language a little bit. Um, don't be too scared. No, it's, it's good. It's easy yeah, it's really here. good. It's chapter 12. Okay. Uh, but I I found this very clarifying. Um, and yes, for it absolutely should be for preachers, right? Because this is your whole task, is you're right. trying to make sense of what's in here and then communicate that to make sense and do something to the people sitting in your pews, right? That, that totally sure. makes sense. But, you know, just for the lay interpreter as yeah. well, um, to ask these questions, just to understand, you know, different, the author could intend something different maybe than our first reaction to the text, you right. know? Uh, so those are just good things to wrestle with and understand um, or, or seek understanding about what is going on here. We will talk about this in a little bit. I think the type of literature is going to direct how we understand what the author is yeah. trying to say. And we have some specifics with some of those types, but we'll get into that in um, another conversation. But okay, just for, can you think of any examples? And we're totally doing this off the top of your head. So uh, we'll, we'll try to do this together. Can you think of any examples of maybe a good yeah. way to interpret the pragmatics of a text and then maybe a way that it hadn't, or it isn't interpreted well and can kind of throw the meaning off of something. I got one. Go ahead. Because <laughs> I think about this all the time. <laughs> um, I would say that uh, 
I think the Psalms can be interpreted uh, a couple different ways. We are going to talk about this in prophecy a little bit because I think there are some nuances here. But sometimes you have to just sit back and ask the question, what is the author intending to do with this Psalm? What we really want to do is jump right into our lives and how this immediately, like those words speak to us. But I think what a better practice is, is thinking about like this word, these prayers that David wrote, you know, in his context, like what is he, you know, dealing with? What is he saying? And then we have to take it through how this has been fulfilled in Christ, because all these steps are, we're on the other side of the cross. So the, the things that he's yearning for and the, and the faith that he has, you know, trust in is actually embodied in a person, which is Christ. And so when he's asking, uh, when he's intending to do something with his words and he's asking his hearers to respond, we, we you know, try to see what that is. But then we just don't stop there. You know, then we say, okay, who... Who am I now in this situation? Mm-hmm. Am mm-hmm. I who David is actually talking to? Yeah, yeah. Or like you said in your sermon, maybe you take that intention that the response of the of the hearer, uh, and we see it on the other side of a crucified and risen Lord. Like, okay. How do we then? So I, I just did uh, another thing. I just did this with um, uh, Valley Dry Bones and Ezekiel thirty-seven. Uh, and I was just like really playing with it too. Like, yeah. okay, we know he is speaking to a cut off people in Babylon, these kind of things. Right. But, but the, the text is a, is a word of comfort and promise to people that are dead. Um, it, it wants them to trust in the promises of God that will resurrect people from the dead. Right. Well, that goes far beyond the ancient people of God trapped in Babylon. It is that. Right. Right. And, but so then in the, in the, as you're preaching the sermon, I say, you know, it's okay to, I don't think I said that. I said much more clever <laughs> that, that we meditate upon or, or reflect on who we are and what, what is our Valley of dry bones? How mm-hmm. are we, mm-hmm. I think I even said like citizens of the Valley of dry bones. Like right. this is like, we have our deaths and our destructions and our corruption into which God's promise is proclaimed, right? And so it's it's not we're not skipping, we're not like saying that's us, we're dead, and we're going to be alive. But because Christ has come, right? He's the key into that um, uh, this promise of life and those things. So it, you can then speak that into our struggles now. Yes. So the same, in a sense, the same perlocutionary sort of uh, what is it that that trust in the promises? It's the same both originally in the text yeah. preached to people in Babylon and then today preached right. in Ventura, California. Right. But it's not just saying, you know, you are when you die and your bones are like sitting dry in a right. valley somewhere, right. you know, it's, it's not that immediate one-to-one transfer of right. information, but rather this speech is doing something for the hearers of this people. And now we have a different yeah. situation in life, but we're still hearing the same. And, and something we've talked about a lot, or you brought up a lot, is that the being there's there's something good about simply recognizing this is what we're doing. Yeah. Yes. Right. That yes. we are that we are not ancient Israel. Right? <laughs> yeah. We are grafted into that. You know, you can go through all that, mm-hmm. right? But but like just to be able to say, hey, this does apply. Mm-hmm. But we are taking these steps to get there. So here's another one, just kind of thinking about a different genre, um, because that is prophecy and prophecy gets a little slippery sometimes. But let's just think about like the narrative story of David and Goliath. Classic, yeah. Right. It's a classic one that um, has been taken too far in a lot of hermeneutical ways, because sometimes you'll hear something like, you know, David overcame this huge giant threat in his yeah. life and then immediately taking that and applying it to you too can yeah. overcome this huge you know giant threat in your life because you have this like biblical example of what David did but that's not asking all the questions right the questions are what 
did the author intend by telling this story? So we need to look at like the context of why it was told and what mm -hmm. it's doing, what the hearers were understanding, and not just the immediate hearers, but the hearers of the Christian church. You know, we talked about how this is a this is a a text that's received in a community of faith. Right. And so this was understood as, you know, kind of a foreshadowing of a great event to come, which actually yeah. we would confess all of these stories are about Christ, yeah. right, about right, Jesus. Right. Yeah, yeah. And right. so you, taking those couple extra steps, David and Goliath doesn't necessarily mean you have to go overcome your giants in life. No. But what it actually means is there was somebody that overcame, you know, this great opposition yeah. against God's yeah. people. And now again, yeah. on the other side of uh, on the other side of the cross, we faithfully look towards, you know, our hope which is right. Christ. Yeah. In other words, it's like again that's again asking the right questions, wrestling with the text. To say, yeah, you're not David in this story. Right. You, if anyone, you're you're the the Israelites cowering on the sideline. Mm -hmm. Christ is your David, mm -hmm. who goes forth to faith face Goliath, and in praise the Lord, he does that. Right, that we have that assurance, that promise. So it's these questions of pra pragmatics that kind of point us to look at our situation. Like, what does this mean here, and what can it mean for us here as well? And the connection isn't, you know, just, you know, I'm the, I'm the person in the story and that's the only connection I have. But actually the connection is what is communicated and yeah, yeah, what yeah, yeah, is yeah. received. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. that can mean like that, that's, that should be a wonderful thing yeah. for pastors. Yeah. Because Absolutely. Because yeah. the, the images that you could use and the connections yeah. then are infinite. Yeah. Because you're still taking the biblical principle of what is true but now you're saying it in so many different ways that um, still relates Christ as the truth in our situation for us. Like you'll hear that all the time. Yeah, for us. <laughs> for yeah, yeah, us. Yeah, for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 All right. Excellent. Uh, I mean, that's just kind of scratching the surface um, really is. of this. But but it is uh, an immensely beneficial tool. Uh, these kind of asking these kind of questions will help your Bible study, will help your uh, your preaching for sure. Um, uh, so you know, wrestle with these things. I mean, wrestle with them. They and the, the more you do it, the better. Uh, maybe the better you I mean, maybe you get better, but you at, at least it comes a little quicker the more you do it. I mm -hmm. think, uh, and you can kind of settle on on these clear things that 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 help us move from this ancient text. Mm -hmm to the people that it, we're with today. And it really frames something that is foreign and a long ways away from us. It frames it in a faithful way so that it, something like that can speak to us today. Right. We just, you know, we just got to be asking proper questions. We're right. asking the questions that the text uh, wants to answer or is there answering. There you go. That's not, good. Not questions that it does yeah. not answer yeah. for us. All right, uh, very good. Take a minute to like and subscribe if you haven't done that yet. Check out uh, our other videos in this series, and um, God bless your preaching.